Uh, so, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, before we get started, we have a couple small housekeeping matters. I'd like to remind everyone that the Zoom Q&A feature is turned on, so the audience, please feel free to submit any questions you have through the Q&A feature, and we'll try to take them towards the end. Uh, we will record this presentation, this webinar, and post that on the IA website afterwards. And we will now go ahead and begin with our first speaker. We'll have a welcome from Luke LeBuff on behalf of the ESG Task Force of the IEA's Critical Minerals Working Party. Um, and Luke is the Director of International Affairs and Trade Division in the, for the Land and Minerals Sector at Natural Resources Canada. Please go ahead, Luke. Thank you, Casey. Uh, I'm sure it's all news to many of you here today but it is worth repeating that the energy transition is highly minerals and metals intensive. Uh, this has generated a global rush to secure supply chains and to ensure that these supply chains are resilient to disruptions that could slow progress to meet net zero emission targets. At the same time, this global surge in interest to secure supply chains for the energy transition has raised the profile of ESG characteristics tied to the global extractive sectors and related supply chains. Uh, Canada's own critical mineral strategy is underpinned by the importance of adhering to the highest ESG standards at all points of the supply chain. So we are very pleased to see momentum on this work continue to, to increase. And we are very supportive of the work that the IEA is doing in this area and of reports like the one that uh, we will hear about today, which really helps to drive this work forward. Um, the report of the IEA on, on critical mineral supply chains and ESG explores how the ESG impacts of mining and processing operations can limit the critical mineral supplies needed for clean energy transitions and outlines five key recommendations for policymakers to ensure that critical mineral supply chains are sustainable and responsible. It also includes deep dives into six priority areas that have important implications for supply, including security, water, greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity, human rights, communities, and corruption. Uh, the report was released in mid-December alongside an update of the IEA's uh, Critical Minerals Policy Tracker, which now includes over 200 new policies, laws, and regulations, as well as a special focus on policies aimed at ESG issues. The IEA Office of Legal Counsel will be guiding us through the key findings of the report and the updates of the tracker uh, today. Following their presentation, we will hear from a panel of external partners to offer diverse perspectives on a variety of aspects of the report, and they will share their thoughts on potential directions for future work by the IEA on this topic. We will then finish with um, a Q&A sessions from the floor. Uh, so given that we have so much to discuss. Let's jump right in. Uh, without further ado, I will pass the floor back to you, Casey, and, um, and for your colleagues from the IEA Office of the Legal Council. Thank you and have a great webinar. Thank you for those opening words, Luke. Um, and as, as you noted, we'll now do a brief presentation introducing the IEA's report on sustainable and, and responsible critical mineral supply chains and the critical minerals policy tracker, which were released last month. And following the presentation, as Luke mentioned, we'll have a panel discussion. So please submit any questions you have on the, both the presentation and the panel that we'll come to towards the end. Um, and now we'll just share our slides. But in the meantime, just to introduce the, the presenters. So I'm, I'm Casey Michaels in the IEA's Office of Legal Counsel, and I'm joined by my colleagues Joyce Roboka and Alex Hegarty. And we'll also be joined by um, a colleague from the OECD, Louis Marichal, who will join from, will offer a perspective from the OECD um, as, a, as, a, as a contributor to this report. Next slide. So we've started this report and the, the underlying question that support that this report is built on is the question of the connection between ESG, um, sustainable and responsible supply chains and energy security and mineral security. So over time, we've started to see growing pressure to develop new mines and processing facilities and refining and refineries to support the clean energy transition. And this brings increased pressure on the environment, workers, communities, indigenous people, and on society. So alongside efforts to reduce demand and increase circularity, which can have uh, which can reduce pressures for 
the need on primary supply. It's also imperative that the entire international community work to mitigate and minimize these harms and potential harms to people and the environment. And one of the things that we've tried to do in this report is we've tried to delineate or really delve into the specific ways that these ESG issues and failings can lead to supply problems. So we've listed a few here on this slide. To begin with, they can serve to limit market access and create legal barriers when regulatory requirements cannot be met. Uh, so essentially reducing the amount of supply that can be available if there are limitations that require you know, certain high level ESG performance. It can also, ESG risks can discourage investment in new projects. Uh, they can also damage the reputation of companies whenever there are large incidents, which can deter both investors and buyers. Um, ESG issues can also increase the likelihood of opposition from local communities and other stakeholders for particular projects that are going forward, which over time can pose a, a major issue for supply. And of course, there are acute supply disruptions that are associated with uh, incidents. So for example, if a, if a facility has to shut down due to environmental permit issues or to a, you know, an incident, a safety incident, that obviously has direct and immediate implications for supply availability. So altogether, these potential supply risks can also limit the ability of the market to scale up clean energy technologies at the rate and pace that's required to meet global climate goals. And therefore, limitations of, on ESG can directly impact energy security. And I'll, I'll pause here just for a moment because I, I think that Louis want, from the OECD wanted to add a point uh, or two on this topic. Yeah, thank you very much, Casey, and thank you for uh, inviting the OECD. These are really recommendations that we would fully share um, and actually focusing more specifically on, on some of the points that you have raised here. We are already facing um, some situations in the, in the global markets where the lack of ability to uh, secure the social license to operate is creating major disruptions. Um, I, I don't need to elaborate too much on the situation of a couple of um, major mining investments in Latin America, in particular in copper. Um, we're all also uh, witnessing tensions in, in other supply chains. Um, and, a, and a broader point I think that we are very keen to make here at the OECD is uh, really to underline to what extent and increasingly um, the lack of ability to demonstrate responsible sourcing can actually create um, criticality. And we're seeing this uh, at the moment in, in supply chains um, of, of minerals coming out of conflict affected and high risk areas, uh, where this lack of um, transparency is actually deterring <clears throat> not necessarily investments, uh, but buyers of those minerals. Um, so the criticality can also come from this specific um, aspect. Um, so we're extremely uh, glad that the IEA um, has reached out to, to the OECD and a number of other organizations um, to make sure that all those perspectives were um, taken into consideration and factored in. Um, I think that it's probably one of the most concerning aspects uh, that, we, that we foresee, the lack of social acceptance. Um, in OECD countries as well as in non-OECD countries, and, and hopefully those recommendations um, that will be presented will will help um, create that trust more broadly uh, globally um, to ensure that mining investments are, are accepted locally. Thank you, Louis. So this is really the backdrop for the report. So this context is the, the main cause for the entire energy community to take interest in minerals, ESG issues and mineral security. And on the next slide, we have in the report identified five high level recommendations for policymakers that can help governments to take, or take positive action, proactive action to reduce ESG risks. So the first is to ensure that legal and regulatory protections for the environment, workers, indigenous peoples and communities are supported by sufficient means of implementation and enforcement regimes. I mean, the, the first, really the first port of call on most ESG issues is what do the legal and regulatory protections already, already require and are they adequately enforced? And there's a lot that can be done to ensure that those legal systems are fit for purpose and are being, are, are being actively used. 
The second recommendation is on public spending and on the way that governments use their various, um, various incentive mechanisms to encourage the development of better practices and incentivize good performance. Um, this is very much embodied by a lot of the things that came out of the US Inflation Reduction Act. Um, but at the same time, there are many governments across the world that we found in some of our work that are starting to, to use public spending to encourage improvements. That's, that could be in the realm of uh, research and development support, but also in developing other types of uh, improving ESG standards in other ways. So the third area is on strengthening the collection and reporting of granular and standardized data. Uh, one of the things that we discovered, one of the key findings of this report is the relatively low level of data on most ESG issues. Some of them, particularly on the GHG side, are relatively well represented, but some of the other ones we found it very difficult to get a snapshot exactly of how the industry is doing. And we think there's a lot that could be done to improve the quality of data to a better enable prog progress tracking. Fourth is on the point of transparency throughout the supply chain. Uh, this is really measures that ensure companies enhance traceability, undertake due diligence and report publicly on risks and mitigation actions. Because ultimately it needs to be, it's not enough that companies are undertaking the right measures, we also need to be able to demonstrate that so that purchasers and you know, other players throughout the supply chain um, can, can, can see that. And finally, there's an important role for standards. And there's also an important role for policymakers to support the development of initiatives that allow companies and help companies demonstrate that their operations are sustainable and responsible. So there is a, a link to the transparency point here, but this is a, a distinct point in the way that there needs to be a common understanding as to what good ESG practice looks like. And I'll hand it back over to Louis briefly on, on, on these points as well. Thank you, Casey. Uh, just to add a couple of thoughts to, to the points that you've um, just laid out. Um, looking at public spending, um, we also are um, mindful that this should also extend to public spending um, to support uh, governance institutions in host countries and producing countries, because obviously uh, there's going to be a, a stark increase in the mining investments in a number of um, developing countries that will not necessarily have uh, the capacity to welcome those. Um, so it's it's really important that we think about how collectively, um, you know, public spending and, and, and development assistance can be channeled to those countries. Of course, this will benefit host countries, but this will also benefit investors because they will be faced with um, civil servants that have the capacity to process their applications and, and to demonstrate uh, that they actually understand and are able to monitor the development of the, of the projects. Um, just looking at uh, recommendation three and four, I mean, this, is, this comes down ultimately to a very important point that I already raised in the previous slide is the ability or collective ability to, to build trust around the mining sector and, and mineral supply chains. Um, in order to bring investors and, and companies and international buyers on board. Uh, one of the key obstacles to investment in trade in mineral resources, in particular in high-risk jurisdiction, is, is precisely the lack of, of trust um, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and so the point here is really to, to be able to demonstrate that it is actually possible uh, to measure improvement over time of a number of uh, of key metrics um, that go uh, that are that are really key in the um, in the mining sector. On point number four, uh, from the OECD standpoint, we would also like to uh, stress again that, of course, traceability is is an important aspect, but it should not be confused with with due diligence. Uh, traceability supports due diligence. Um, it's it's also um, supported by developing a number of developing technologies. But technology cannot be the panacea. And, and as we often put it, um, companies and, and stakeholders will always need boots on the ground to be able to monitor the development of, of the working conditions um, of, of the minerals. Um, this is really, again, something that we want to, to emphasize, as well as the, um, the responsibility of companies, uh, ultimately, and that, that relates to point five. Um, industry initiatives are obviously uh, very welcome. Um, they can help uh, share costs, they can help uh, leverage um, commercial positions of a number of companies in mineral supply chains, 
But ultimately, it's it's really important that uh, companies understand that they retain responsibility for the impact of their operations. Um, one last point also on, on those industry initiatives that we actually tend to work a lot with. Um, one key point is to what extent uh, those initiatives are credible. And this is work that is ongoing at the OECD Secretariat, um, along with other partners, um, developing criteria for credibility of those industry initiatives and, and standards um, is really paramount for us. And, and we believe ultimately this will help um, stakeholders and, and the wider public opinion to make their own determination on the um, effectiveness of these industry initiatives. Um, one final point for us, it's really important that everyone understands that obviously um, ESG is, is of the utmost importance, but we need to have high ESG ambitions, but we also need to be able to have a roadmap for how we can achieve those ambitions. If expectations are set too high at the beginning, uh, the investments will not flow in and companies and, and stakeholders will not be able to leverage um, those investments to improve the, the situation on the ground. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Louis, for that those perspectives. Um, we'll now go through the next few elements of the report. So what we did, we created, we developed these five key recommendations at the high level, and then we sought to apply them to specific ESG risks. And I'll now, for the next slide, hand it over to my colleague, Alex, to take uh -huh. us through that. Yes. Um, yeah, so we focused on um, a couple few areas that are important for, um, that have important implications for the security of supply. Um, and these fall broadly into three buckets, environmental, social, and governance buckets. And just to say that we've chosen these risks um, through our conversations with people, um, they've been identified as important for supply security. Um, but this isn't to say that there aren't other important risks that are also important for supply security and also just important um, for uh, high ESG standards in general. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so we've, we've applied e our five recommendations to each um, focus area, adjusting those recommendations to be more specifically applicable to each focus risk. Um, this is just a snapshot of examples um, of how we've applied the recommendations to each focus risk across the recommendations. Um, so for example, you can see for um, legal and regulatory protections, specifically for water, uh, we recommend that where it doesn't already exist, policymakers should include targets for water quality, use and effluence that improve over time, as well as include, um, do a review of how uh, stringently those are implemented. Um, and for our recommendation on public spending for the, um, for the risk of GHG emissions, uh, we recommend strategic investment decisions, uh, which are tied to the reduction of emissions or energy use intensity. Um, and if you look in the reports, um, I won't go over all of them because it's quite a, quite a lot, if you can imagine this whole table uh, filled in, but you'll see each of our five recommendations applied to each key issue area. Next slide, please. And again, I won't go into depth into every focus area, but I do want to do a bit of a deep dive into one example focus area to provide a snapshot of our um, analysis. So as I mentioned before, we chose um, six key focus areas, one of which is biodiversity. Biodiversity can, impact, can be impacted through mining and processing activities as they are often destructive to the surrounding ecosystem and require land use changes. So of course, this is dependent on the type of mine, the geologic, geological mineral source, and the geographical context. Um, and we can see that biodiversity is emerging as a very important contributor to supply risk. Um, already, we can see that there are exa examples of, the, of biodiversity creating supply disruptions, as can be seen from these examples on the table. Um, and as we develop more mines for the energy transition, this will be increasingly important. But data is largely lacking on this risk and how impactful it can be. One of the few analyses done at the moment is from SMP, which is this table in the top right. And it shows um, the portion of all mines uh, in key bi biodiversity areas for transition risks in different um, countries. Next slide. And so how are companies performing when it comes to addressing and 
uh, avoiding biodiversity impacts. From IEA analysis, current company reporting doesn't allow for a com an industry-wide um, assessment of the progress towards addressing and avoiding biodiversity risks. But from the data that we can obtain through public company reports, we can see that among the top um, 20 mining companies, um, or sorry, among the top 10 critical mineral companies, most nickel producers have announced a public commitment to follow a mitigation hierarchy approach, uh, which is a way of addressing biodiversity risk, compared with about half of the top 10 nickel, uh, lithium and cobalt companies. Um, though, of course, context is crucial for this risk, so it might just be the case that nickel operations are more likely to be located in high biodiversity areas. Um, but even so, overall, only a quarter of these companies have no net loss or net positive impact commitments. Um, and looking at company reported metrics, only a few, uh, a select few of the top 20 major uh, companies in critical minerals report on biodiversity metrics. Um, and these often only cover land rehabilitation or land disturbed. Um, although this is consistent with the Global Reporting Initiative's current um, standard on biodiversity, and this is in the process of being updated and published. So hopefully we will see more, um, more metrics um, reported on. And for land rehabilitated, we can see that it's remained mostly flat over the past few years, um, and that land rehabilitation per revenue decreased from 2020 to 2021. And notably, many companies didn't report any biodiversity metrics at all, um, and less than half of the companies assessed reported on land impacts. So there's definitely still room for improvement. Joyce, over to you. Thank you, Alex. In the report, we also looked at how voluntary standards and um, policies treat each focus area, which I'll be discussing in the next few slides. Um, first, we looked at the commitments in mine site level standards. Um, you will see these on the, on the slide, namely Copper Mark, International Council for Mining and Metals, Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, or IRMA, and Towards Sustainable Mining, TSM. To protect biodiversity in particular, most jurisdictions already legally prohibit uh, mining in legally protected areas. So on that first level that you see there, all four standards already cover this and require this as a commitment um, to all their members. And this it's the same for the second level that you see, which is requiring utilization of mitigation hierarchy, like Alex mentioned. Um, as for the third, um, until January of this year, the three um, standards, Copper Mark, IRMA, and TSM require this, and now ICMM requires it as well to require a commitment to no net loss. And Copper Mark and IRMA, uniquely to them, um, require their members to maintain benefits of ecosystem services, respect um, key biodiversity areas, and encourage their members um, to have a net positive impact for the mine sites. And what does this mean um, for the security of supply? So we can see that consumer countries evaluating mineral imports can, can consider based on these standards and reporting on these standards, whether mining operations have taken steps to prevent any adverse impacts and also prevent supply cuts due to stoppages or even more stringent regulations. And they can assess risk um, per project accordingly. To conclude this slide, we found that there is a role for standards and they help drive regulatory goals towards improved protection and mitigation of supply risks. So this brings us to regulations around the world and our, our report does go through um, some regulations in each uh, key area. And these are just a few sample regulations that we talk about in our report and is also found in our critical minerals policy tracker, which um, brings me to the next slide. Um, our critical minerals policy tracker was launched in 2022 and it has, um, and over, and in December, 2023, we updated these, um, we updated these to have to include um, even more policies, generally focusing on um, encouraging sustainable and responsible practices. The policy tracker 
includes policies and in these three key areas. The first is ensuring reliable and resilient supply. The second is incentivizing new supplies. And third is sustainable and responsible supply. So because of this report, we did have a lot more of the third um, in these policies, uh, in, the, in the tracker. And so for our update, we have a broader country scope. We now cover over 35 countries, um, when in the past we had around 25. We have more than 500 new entries. And we have seen these general trends in recent policies on critical minerals. There are new strategic plans um, in mining. There are more sustainability due diligence laws that cover mining. There's, there are more reforms of mining codes around the world, tax credit schemes, and cooperation, international cooperation agreements, and these include um, bilateral agreements um, as well between countries. So we'll send the link to our CMPT on the chat and so that you can explore um, the data and policies more. I'll and, and that concludes our presentation on the report and the CMPT. I'll hand it over to you, Casey, for the next part of our webinar. And yeah, thank you for taking us through some of those key points. I, I hope what you all got a picture from is that this report is quite rich. Uh, we touched on only biodiversity when there's actually six key topics we've delved into. Um, and I encourage everyone to, to take a look. And this is really meant to give you a bit of a flavor of what's in that report. We'll now turn to the, for the remainder of this webinar, we will open to a panel of civil society, industry, and government experts that are here with us today. Uh, I'll let each of them introduce themselves as we go, but we'll hear first from Marina Ruta from IGF, and then from Mathieu Salomon from uh, the NRGI, and then Mona Tatou Breton from the French government, and then from Henri Fleury from, from Glencore. So let, we'll start with... Uh, with Marina, please go ahead. Thank you, Casey. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. So thanks for inviting us to this webinar and of course for benchmarking IGF's mining policy framework in the report. My name is Marina Ruete. I'm a senior law advisor for the IGF. Uh, the IGF is an intergovernmental forum on mining and sustainable development. And more than 80 countries rich in mineral resources are members of the IGF and they're represented by their mining authorities. Now, focusing on the report, uh, well, we thought the report is very comprehensive and rich, as you were saying, and it links to the traditional sustainable development challenges of the mining sector into the critical minerals discussion. Uh, so congratulations on that first. Um, and I will want to focus on the, because I cannot focus on everything, it's pretty comprehensive, so I will focus only on one part of the report that mentions the significant pressure that governments are receiving to expedite permitting processes so that they can respond to the demand of critical minerals. So we see also there is a current focus on reducing permitting times. It is an old pressure within the fallacy of to attract investment, governments need to reduce permitting times. Uh, and in consequence, there is a temptation to relax uh, environmental, social and governance protections in law or in practice. We see it has now resurfaced with critical mineral strategies. However, we, seen, uh, we have seen that uh, relaxing protections have proven to be an obstacle to mining operations too. For example, where Louis was mentioning, a mine without proper consultation might in the future close due to a protest. See Panama's copper mine. We have one of the largest scale copper mines, a critical mineral. Also 4% of the GDP of the country being closed in 2024 because process at the granting of the concession many years ago were not followed. And today society has decided that they would rather protect their Mesoamerican biodiversity corridor than having an open pit mine in the middle of their jungle, which is absolutely fair. But this is a decision to be made during the permitting process and not after a six billion investment with a fully operating mine, which has now to close, close with billions in closing costs plus international arbitration demands. And of course, a disrupted uh, supply of copper to the world. So 
We see the report rightly highlights the importance of having legal regimes that are fit for purpose and that are effective. This is not slow. It is about reviewing legal systems and making sure robust and effective protections for the environment workers, indigenous peoples and communities are there. We see the report also then kindly benchmarks with the uh, IGF mining policy framework. This is a mining governance standard, uh, unique and different from other standards because it's not for industry, it's for governments and mining governance. It makes recommendations which are international good practice in laws, policies and implementations. I mentioned that it's good practice and not always best practice because we're speaking about producer countries, many times developing countries. Uh, the standard is driven by IGF members, so it's not the secretariat, it's the members uh, that drive it. It was born in 2010 and it was reviewed and updated last year. So any government, for example, that is preparing their strategies on critical or strategic minerals can follow it and assess their laws, policies and standards. It has six thematic pillars, many of which are mentioned in this report. Uh, it was mentioned as part of the risks. So laws, policies and institutions has inside the permitting system. So how to assess your permitting system, the financial benefits goes deep into how to design fiscal regimes and distribute the financial benefits. So economic benefits, for example, the report uh, mentions communities and human rights. Uh, we have recommendations specifically on this issue. Environmental management, uh, we divide it in water, biodiversity management, air and noise, um, waste management and emergency preparedness. And this report, IA's report, mentions water, greenhouse emissions and biodiversity. And then we have two more pillars. One, it's specifically on mine closure. It's called my, uh, post mining transition. So we look at the transition to closure. And then ASM, so artisanal and small scale mining, we kind of do uh, an assessment or recommendation specifically for this uh, scale of mining. We had a 2023 update uh, because there's new issues coming in this last 10 years, including climate change, transparency, uh, transparency which is mentioned uh, as the risk of corruption in this uh, report, and then gender equity, which are transversally included. Uh, and we added that before we didn't have that, this was a request from mining authorities, the institutional arrangements. We have two documents. One is the MPF itself, which for lawyers is like the constitution, very short and sweet. And a recommendation for uh, government would be, for example, require mining entities to consult indigenous peoples when mining activities may affect them, obtaining free, prior and informed consent when applicable. In this case, for example, we are following ILO Convention 169. And then there's guidance note with further information, including also international standards that are applicable to industry, but may be positive for, for governments to look at. So we offer our members impartial assessments based on, on the MPF. We've done 17 of these um, since 2013. It is a thorough process that had helped governments realign their priorities based on their objectives. And we understand that there is now a new momentum for members and for every country to revisit their legal system due to the pressure of critical minerals demand. So we invite governments when considering to shorten their permitting timelines and in general prepare their critical mineral strategies to assess their laws and policies and institutions thoroughly to respond to this demand and the MPF is in our website to help you. And coming back to the report, producing countries should balance the expectations of the investors and, and consumer countries with the amount of time really needed uh, to review environmental and social impact assessments and other permitting documents. If not, we will risk the protections as well as stopping productions in the future, like the case of Panama. IEA is right in highlighting the importance of insurance of ensuring legal and regulatory protections, and we hope to support governments in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Marina, for that for that intervention, and thank you also for reminding everyone what IGF stands for, since, uh, to, to save us on that long acronym. <laughs> and now we'll turn to Mathieu Salomon from the Natural Resource Governance Institute.
Uh, thanks a lot, Casey, and uh, and uh, NRGI, Natural Resource Governance Institute, another acronym. Uh, I'm Matthias Salomo. I'm leading on our anti-corruption work. NRGI is a think tank, do tank, working on extractive governance. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizer of the webinar on behalf of NRGI for inviting me uh, to and inviting us to review this report and now to join this panel. It's really encouraging to see the IEA engaging more with civil society organization. So we really commend the IEA for such interesting, constructive and concrete report, which we're sure has been enriched through considering comments and expertise from civil society. The five recommendations put forward are extremely relevant, as well as the six focus or risk area identify. In the interest of time, I'll keep my comments focused on three quick points the importance of enforcement, of independent monitoring, and of uh, assessing, addressing corruption risk. First, enforcement. By enforcement, I mean increased capacities and resources for relevant agencies. Uh, it's mentioned in the report, uh, but it's something that we would give more emphasis. Uh, without strong enforcement, good laws don't mean anything. Uh, this is especially relevant for recommendation one of the report on robust, robust legal and regulatory protection. I saw that the slides now present the recommendation in a, in a way that uh, will put more uh, more emphasis on, on enforcement, and it's good. We've seen major anti-corruption cases fall apart recently in the mining space, uh, such as the UK case against ENRC, uh, which sends, we think, the wrong signal, the wrong message about accountability for wrongdoing. And government, and including IEA members, need to step up their game on, on this. Uh, we were glad to see legal framework as the first recommendation, as monetary approaches should always be prioritized over voluntary ones from, from our experience. Um, we'd welcome more analysis and comparison between legal frameworks and voluntary standards from the IEA, uh, since you ask what IEA could work on more. Uh, and especially on, on the implementation and enforcement of this legal framework and voluntary standard and on their impact on practices improvement. Um, my second point about independent monitoring, linked to enforcement, independent monitoring will also be key if one wants the recommendation put forward in the report to have impact. And so one aspect that could have been given more emphasis in the report is the importance of civic space. For example, recommendation five of the report on the development of credible voluntary sustainability standards. For us, the inclusion of civil society groups and other impacted actors, such as communities, indigenous groups, trade unions, is fundamental to credibility and avoiding greenwashing. Uh, this is a principle embedded in existing initiative in the space, such as the EITI, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, strong civil society protocol, so this shouldn't be controversial. The need to ensure companies engage with civil society could also have been emphasis uh, in recommendation number two, for example, on the report on public spending and encouraging better practices. Also not the focus of this report, private investors probably have even a stronger role uh, on this question and recommendation too. And final point about the importance of corruption risk. Uh, on corruption especially, uh, really good to see the challenges acknowledged in the report especially in the context of a transition mineral rush and the potential consequences underlying legal liability, delays, disruption, not to mention the ways in which corruption will prevent justice in transition. Uh, strengthening transparency around contract and beneficial ownership is key and producing countries and companies must act on this. The ITI 2023 standard has welcomed new anti-corruption requirements uh, but as mentioned in the report, overall different mining standards could be strengthened when it comes to anti-corruption requirement. To include, for example, requirement on political contribution, transparency, lobbying, beneficial ownership of subcontractors or use of intermediaries, for example. At NHGI, together with partners, we have published a number of recommendations to support anti-corruption in transition mineral supply chain. Uh, which should provide some important ideas on where to focus efforts. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, I think the final point I'd like to make is on the interconnectedness of harms in the mining space. At NRGI, we have designed a corruption diagnostic tool, which has already been used in key transition mineral locations like the Philippines, Guinea, Chile, 
Drawing on this work, we've recently developed new modules on issues such, such as links between corruption and social environmental impacts. And we'd encourage anyone who is interested in understanding these issues and how to address them to get in touch with me. Uh, drawing the links between these issues, and in particular how the G in governance of governance is for national to the E and S of environmental and social, uh, maybe could have come through a bit more in the report and maybe a fruitful future area of work for the IEA. Um, but that doesn't prevent this report of being incredibly useful guidance for decision makers in this space. And we look forward to seeing how the recommendation are taken up. Thanks. Thank you, Mathieu, for, for that intervention. And we'll now turn to uh, Monette tatou baton from, from, the, from the French government. Yes, thank you, uh, Kefi. Um, I am Muna Tatou uh, Breton, uh, Deputy Head of uh, the Mineral Resources uh, Department uh, at the Ministry of uh, Ecological Transition in France. First, I would like uh, to thank the IEA for uh, this work that summarized the challenges that societies are facing, and especially policymakers and companies on securing minerals for energy transition. As a government, our objective to secure our supplies for energy transition are strongly linked with the objectives of the respect of high ESG standards. Companies also understood that addressing those aspects goes with the mitigation of supply risks. Improving the environmental, social and governance standards is a continuous process. We thank the IEA on bringing governments, industry and NGOs together around this webinar as we need a collective effort to go further. As a policymaker, maybe I can give some details on how we already address some aspects of the recommendations of the report and how we can go further. For the first aspect, which is ensuring robust reg regulatory regimes, at the French and the European level in general, we have now a set of regulations addressing the risks listed in the second part of the report, for example, water, gas, emission, and etc., which applies in Europe. And we completed this regulation by due diligence measures based on the OECD guidelines since 2017. This was followed by battery regulation and now CRM Act. I'm talking only about regulation concerning critical minerals, but there is many other regulations that applies for other uh, uh, industry sectors, but also um, for critical minerals. Concerning the second aspect of recommendation of the report, direct public spending, for example, we launched recently a fund dedicated to security of mineral supply that will finance extracting, transformation and recycling projects. And ESG criteria are key elements when selecting and evaluating the project. The ESG criteria for the fund will not rely only on single private standards, but on a set of requirements resulting from a combination between local regulation and international standards. Concerning tracking and monitoring performance and making supply chains more transparent, those two aspects go together and there is still a lot to do. We agree on the observation of the uh, report regarding the lack of harmonized and publicly available data to assess EHG performance of assets. We need to work together with other stakeholders at international level on metrics and methodological guidance, like what uh, it is done at the EITA, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, maybe also in the future at the ISO level or other international level, where we can bring together consumer and producer countries. This work is essential for more transparency, uh, which is crucial for the implementation of due diligence measures. Concerning the support for standard systems, Standards can give clearly a visibility to consumer and help companies to highlight their efforts. At the European level, we push for a recognition system which can evaluate the adequacy between the European regulation expectation and the criteria evaluated by stand the standards. 
to give a guarantee to downstream companies. And uh, to finish, there is also other aspects that can also be addressed when talking about sustainable supply. I think about substitution and recycling. I know that the OECD is working on that and which is complementary to this work. I would like also to thank the IEA on highlighting the social aspect of EAG. Addressing communities' concern is key for acceptance of the extractive industry. The international forums are a good place to bring together consumers and producers to think about feasible and fair regulation standards and practices, and the IEA can play a role on that. Thank you. Very many thanks, Mona. And we'll now do or pass it over to the last of our panel, Anne-Marie Fleury from Glencore. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, what a, a pleasure to follow after all uh, my uh, great fellow panelists with um, some really interesting interventions. Um, I also want to um, thank IEA for uh, inviting us to participate in this. Um, there's some kind of really key points that were highlighted in the introduction about where we're kind of in a new world here. Um, when uh, Casey and Louis, you were talking about uh, the, the need to pay attention to ESG issues and mineral supply chains, you know, in order to um, secure your social license to operate, et cetera. It, one part of me was thinking, well, you know, that's been there for a long time. That's always been important. But but I do think things are different now um, because we're, we're talking about scaling up um, critical materials. And we are talking about a lot more attention from supply chain and stakeholders. And we're also talking about having not doing things the way we have always done them. Uh, in the past, maybe we, we accepted certain levels of ESG performance for uh, our energy needs with, with various sectors. And, and today, you know, we, we want to do things differently. So, so I do think that the scene setting here is really important, uh, though, of course, the issues are not necessarily new in themselves. Um, so uh, I, I'm Anne-Marie Fleury. Uh, I um, work uh, at Glencore on responsible sourcing um, with the cobalt and lithium trading teams. So I'm very much in the weeds of um, engaging with uh, the supply chain and with stakeholders on um, ESG needs. Um, and we're talking about transparency, uh, communicating um, and uh, also the the standards. Um, before joining Glencore, I worked um, for a, a standard and assurance scheme in the jewelry supply chain. So that's going to be the topic I'm going to focus a little bit more on today. Um, for those of you who are not so familiar with Glencore, I, you may already know Glencore as a, a mining company or a trading company of uh, mineral commodities, including uh, many of the critical ones. Um, Glencore is also, of course, a refining company and a big recycling company as well, including uh, biggest e-waste recycler in North America. Um, so uh, working in many different parts of uh, meeting our critical raw material needs uh, and a big player in uh, copper, nickel, cobalt, and um, now starting as well on, on the lithium side. Um, so as I said, I'm going to focus more on the, the voluntary uh, sustainability standards uh, recommendation in the report uh, with maybe just one comment on, uh, uh, as others have said here, the, the richness of the report overall and its contribution to, to our thinking in this space. Um, Joyce talked a little bit about uh, how standards are a, a useful benchmark for what good ESG uh, practice looks like. Um, and uh, it, we can talk specifically about how, what this looks like for companies operating in the supply chain. So earlier we, we talked about uh, what, what good practice looks like for, for policymaking. 
Um, but uh, I'm going to talk about the the standards in the context of uh, companies operating um, from mining through to um, uh, energy providers, uh, client facing companies. Um, I spoke earlier about us as a society, you know, wanting to see uh, and wanting a lot more transparency and um, different uh, practices to maybe what we've seen in the past. And this is where the voluntary um, standard schemes can really come into play, because generally they involve um, third party assurance and reporting. And so they're about checking and communicating that information to, to the outside world. Um, I think the first point I want to make is that uh, I, I think it's fair to say a, a lot of companies in the supply chain, and, and certainly I, I would say so uh, in the case of Glencore, really believe in these voluntary standards as a tool that can help drive much more effective um, demonstration of ESG practices, as well as driving ESG practices in themselves. Um, so sometimes they're described as a market tool, um, and this is where they could really help um, drive um, uh, change. Um, the paper uh, outlines several um, cred credibility criteria around uh, what what credible voluntary schemes look like, and th they are all excellent points. I, I would agree with everything that's in there. Um, that the need to align with relevant international frameworks, the need for clear scope, uh, the, the need for transparency to be part of the scheme, um, the quality of assurance um, within these schemes. Um, and uh, Matthew talked earlier as well about the, the importance of multi-stakeholder participation in the schemes and how they run, which uh, I think Matthew said, you know, we, we would, this is not a controversial comment, we would all agree, and I would say that as well. Um, there were maybe two things I would have slightly elaborate on or add on um, as uh, uh, in talking about these voluntary schemes. Um, I guess that the first one is, since we're, we're talking about criteria, uh, it's implicit that um, we, we aren't necessarily talking about um, a one size fits all. Uh, and the, the reason I raise this is because when I, we look at the um, mineral supply chain landscape of ESG standards, particularly the mining ones at the upstream end of the supply chain, uh, I think it's fair to say that it's a fairly busy landscape. Uh, and and uh, in engaging on this topic, you, you do hear some people saying, we really need a one size fits all in this space. Um, I would argue that that's not necessarily the thing that is going to um, best drive um, improved practices and more transparency. Different stakeholders um, involved in the mineral supply chains have uh, different needs and drivers for, for what they look for in these voluntary standards. And I, again, I would argue that we are perhaps best served by um, not necessarily just a one size fits all. Now, that's not to say that, um, as I said earlier, it is a busy landscape. I don't think there's a, any uh, uh, benefit in calling for new standards um, in, in what's already quite a, a busy space. Uh, but uh, but certainly um, looking at alignment and interoperability um, with what's out there uh, it is something that could help a lot in pushing for better uptake and adoption and implementation. And perhaps in some cases, uh, convergence as well, uh, though um, by virtue of saying I don't think a one size fits all, um, I would not argue for a... a um, convergence across the board uh, everywhere necessarily. Um, so that's that's one kind of uh, additional consideration. Um, and following on on that point, uh, the, the other consideration would be about uh, interoperability between the standards a, as a criteria. Now, this is something that I'm putting forward very much from the perspective of uh, companies that would be implementing um, these voluntary schemes. Uh, again, companies will usually have 
um, multiple needs that they have to meet through the adoption of these schemes. And so being able to have some interoperability so you're not essentially auditing the same thing multiple times within short timeframes uh, is something that's really important to be able to drive uh, uptake. So um, that that's the other point I would add as uh, something to consider. So uh, two quite detailed points under one of the recommendations of, of the report. Uh, maybe the other thing I'll mention um, is that uh, different um, organizations have done some work on this. And um, one I'm particularly familiar with is the Cobalt Institute, who has been running a consultation process on um, the voluntary scheme, ESG schemes, and will uh, should be completing the work uh, shortly. Uh, so uh, watch this space um, on that topic. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, looking at the clock, we're almost to our allotted hour. We we're able to go a few minutes over, although I think Anne-Marie may have to leave immediately. We have a, a, a bunch of really interesting questions. So we're gonna try to take a couple of them at least before we close. So two questions I want to pose to the panel is the first, there's a really interesting question about the, uh, what, how do we handle the distrust between communities and and, and the mining sector and the mining industry in general. This is obviously a big problem for communities. And a second question that I'm quite interested in, there was a comment about, there's a, about the importance between big mining and small mining and ASM, artisanal and small scale mining. So like there's like some of the things we're talking about apply very differently when we're talking about very large companies, very large projects compared to small independent companies. And then even, even more so, when we're talking about the, the particular challenges of ASM. So given the amount of time, um, if any of the panelists want to speak to either of those questions, perhaps Anne-Marie, since you need to leave early, if you want to respond to either of those, if not, we can pass to other on the panel. I don't have a good answer for you, Casey. I'm thinking of the, the question on ASM um, in particular. But you, I mean, you raise a very good point because in some ways, the ability of larger companies to engage in tools like voluntary schemes is much higher than um, uh, the artisanal informal sector, which by its very definition is not um, engaging as easily in informal processes. Um, I know others on this panel can also co contribute this because I don't have any easy answers, unfortunately, in this space, other than to say that um, the players in the supply chain, downstream and upstream, policymakers, regulators, uh, all the stakeholders, civil society, have to take this point into consideration when looking at how to drive um, the, the best ESG practices. Because when we talk about a just transition, designing systems that um, will exclude um, the artisanal sector entirely uh, would be counterproductive and, and kind of make just transition an oxymoron. Um, so maybe, yeah, I haven't answered your question. I can see others will put their hand up and hopefully can, can add to that. Thanks for that, Emery. I saw Marina's hand and then Louis. So Marina, please go ahead. Thanks, Casey. Uh, yes, we have an ASM program, uh, Artisan and Small Scale Mining is ASM in IGF, and we are working, uh, hopefully coming up with a publication on case studies on ASM and critical minerals. These are critical minerals sourced through ASM. Uh, we've been trying to gather data. There is data that is being gathered by some partners, so we are looking into that. And so we look at it as twofold. One is the opportunities for the ASM sectors. There are some countries that are very focused on artisanal and small scale mining, and there's no large scale mining. And on the other side, it's a bit prepare the governments for, so what traditionally was gold rushes for critical mineral rushes. Uh, so we wanna have a bit of focus on, on that too. Uh, so, Please check again, it's the mining policy framework has the six six pillars. The sixth one is ASM, and that's on governance of this sector. And of course, I'm sure that Lou, you will have something to say on ASM too. Yes, please, Louis, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I mean, <clears throat> indeed, ASM is really one of the key um, aspects that we've been looking at consistently since the beginning of our program. And I think a lot of our efforts has 
been to demonstrate in particular to global um, uh, industry that ASM and large scale mining supply chains um, are more than often and more than we think interconnected. Uh, so I think it's really important to keep that in mind and, and not believe that you can isolate, isolate one from the others, which in turn means that you really have to pay attention to, uh, of course, transparency and integrity in LSM, but also likewise in artisanal and small scale mining. Um, you can't have the same kind of policy responses for both. I think that was well captured in, in the in the guidance. That's certainly something that we uh, always flag and insist on. Uh, but thanks for raising that point because I really want to emphasize that the, the share of artisanal and small scale mining production in, in global supply chain of critical minerals is only increasing. Um, it's, it's coming into lithium where a number of um, private sector actors uh, used to believe that it, it would never. So I think it's it's really something that people need to pay um, attention to. Um, just a quick word on, on the distrust. I think this is really the, the key aspect of everything that we're talking about today. Um, it's distrust you can find in producing countries, but you can find as well in consuming countries. Um, so it's really hard to provide a, a comprehensive response to that. Uh, again, from our perspective, uh, everyone's ability to openly uh, acknowledge the issues uh, and share as much information as possible on the various risks identified and, and the strategies of the companies to mitigate those risks. Um, having frank conversations about those aspects, um, meaningful stakeholder consultations, this all those tactics need to be um, leveraged uh, in order to build the trust uh, um, that we'll need to make the mining sector uh, one of the key contribution to the to the low carbon economy in the future. Thanks, thanks for that, Louis. Um, given the time, we'll go for maybe one more question and then we, we will close. We had a really fascinating question from one of the attendees, essentially calling attention to the urgency of the need for critical minerals for the clean energy transition. This is a point that the IEA has made very strongly that we, if we're the world is to meet its global climate goals, we need significantly more supplies of many of the minerals we're talking about to support those clean energy technologies. And how do we balance that against the fact that permitting takes time and that if we want to do this the right way, at least what we've seen in the past you know, 20, 30 years is that it does take some time. Um, and even then we haven't been fully successful. So how I want to ask a question for any of the panelists who wish to, to respond to that. How do we address that need for urgency without letting standards fall? I know I know Marina spoke about this a little bit, but I think maybe others might want to come in. I saw Louis and then Mathieu. Yeah, I'll keep it short because I've been talking a lot and then Mathieu can, can join. But um, I think there's, there's been a recent wave of, of uh, data points that actually stress that a lot of uh, big money projects have been delayed quite significantly because of everything that we're talking about, so social license to operate and all these aspects. So it, it would probably be wrong to believe that you can actually fast track all of this, because if you want to fast track it now, you'll pay it further down the line. Um, so th that balance is extremely important. Perhaps one aspect of the response is to be able to look at the demand side also. Um, there's a lot of pressure to open new mines for sure, and we, we all agree on that. But in order to um, mitigate some of that pressure, you can also look at how ways through which you can um, reduce the demand uh, to make sure that you know you don't believe that the only viable option is to fast track everything and open as many mines as you can. Those mines will be needed, but if you fast track that, you'll face you'll face challenges and issues further down the line for sure. Uh, not not much to say to add, Casey, to what Louis just uh, replied. Uh, I mean, basically, studies show that the stronger governance uh, in a country then somehow fast fasten the the uh, the licensing and the uh, time between uh, between exploration to exploitation. So um, it's maybe counterintuitive, but the stronger standard you have, somehow the faster you will manage to get the minerals out of the ground. Um, 
and um, and yeah, uh, on, on the question about the trust, uh, just to comment quickly on that, I think it's a process. It needs to be. What is important is that it needs to be obviously acknowledging the mistake of the past is one thing, but then it's about fact. It's about act. It's about how company behave. It's about how government behave, uh, and it's it starts from the consultation and the. Uh, and the consent of communities around uh, the mining site, but it goes until the end of the value chain uh, of the decision chain of of, of mining. Uh, so it's not it's not a one off process. It's just it needs to be yeah. a continuous process of engagement, of consultation, of bene better benefit sharing, better opportunities, and so on. So um, it's going to take time. I think the the distress somehow is not only with communities. I remember in in September last year at the IEA Tra Transition Minerals Summit, there was a lot of complaint about companies not finding young people to hire to become mining engineer. So I think the distrust is not only with communities, not only with consumer country, as we mentioned, but also with uh, citizens who don't necessarily want to go and work uh, in the mining industry. Thanks. Thank you, Mathieu. And as we're now a little bit over time, I think we'll go ahead and close. I did just want to finish with one last question that I, I think I'll take the prerogative of the, as the moderator to answer myself. We had a question on what role do critical minerals have in ensuring a just energy transition and a people-centered transition? And I just want to say that at least from the IA's perspective, and I think all the panelists will agree that a there are no people-centered transitions that don't have sustainable and responsible critical mineral supply. It's absolutely critical. The two are linked um, and we see them that way. So I just wanted to say, at least from our side, there's no ambiguity there. Um, and with that, I want to thank all of our panelists and I'll turn it over now to Pascal Lafon, the chief legal counsel of the IEA, who, who will close this out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Casey. And, and hello, everyone. It's going to be very difficult for me to sum up because um, there were a lot of uh, excellent points which were made. What um, I think struck me was the broad consensus around this virtual table uh, among various participants, governments, um, civil society, industry, um, think tanks, uh, international organizations, um, a broad consensus uh, on, on the five um, recommendations that were in the report, and I would like to thank the team here, Casey, Joyce and uh, Alex, uh, but also all the reviewers, all of you who contributed to the success of this report. Um, broad consensus on the importance of trust. Mathieu just um, mentioned it again. Um, we are lawyers, nobody's perfect. Uh, and we know how important it is to make sure that when uh, an investment or a host country welcome uh, an investment, how important it is to make sure that this investment is uh, uh, going to last. Uh, a few of you have highlighted some examples where the mines had to close with uh, a possible arbitration and huge costs, not only for the host country, financial cost, reputational costs, but also for uh, the local communities. So I think it's absolutely vital that the legal environment uh, and the regulations, and this is why we try to address in our report and continue to do so, um, are, um, allow these investments uh, to uh, work for the benefit uh, of all. Um, I, I liked what um, Mathieu highlighted uh, in terms of enforcement, independent monitoring, and addressing the corruption risk. I think this is something that is part of the broader question of trust. Uh, which uh, um, is key to uh, take into account. Um, and I think there is also a broad consensus on how much there is still to do in ESG. I was uh, um, following from a distance the, the debates in Davos last week, and I was struck by the fact that how little ESG was uh, uh, discussed and put on the table. So um, the IEA will... Uh, continue working with you. We're delighted to have you with us on this project. Um, I would like to thank the governments of Australia, of Canada. Thank you, Luke, as well, for chairing the um, ESG task force. You're doing wonderful work. Uh, but also um, Japan and the US uh, to fund us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do that work. 
Um, and I hope we can continue that inclusive work between all of us. Um, I thank you again very much for the uh, very productive debate today um, and wish you a very good rest of the day or evening, wherever you are. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Pascal.